This morning we're going to be looking at two passages in the book of Genesis. And before we start with our reading and talking about them, I just want to ask you to join me in prayer. Father God, as we open Scripture, as we consider it, I pray that you will make as alive for us today as those words were several thousand years ago, and that you will speak to us as clearly today as you did several thousand years ago. You are the same God then that you are now, and the same God now that you were then. And so we trust our hearts to you this morning, and I trust myself and what I have to say to you as well, and pray that you'll fill it with your Holy Spirit and prepare the way in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to start with Genesis chapter 45. We're going to read the first eight verses. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. Now the scene is in a room where he is uh, in a position of power, and his brothers have come looking for food because of a famine that's going on, and they're desperate for food, and he recognizes them, but they do not recognize him, and at this point he cannot control himself anymore. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed. And do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land. And for the next five years, there will not be plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. I'm going to be reading in a few moments from chapter 50 as well. But I want to pause for a moment to consider this scene. Because it is an astonishing scene when you think about it. This moment when Joseph reveals himself to his brothers because he recognizes them, though they do not recognize him, they had hated him. They had purposed to murder him. Ended up, in the end, selling him into slavery instead. And now here he is in Egypt, and they have come looking for food because... They are terrified of, of, of the famine that's going on, and they've come to this great official who has the power of life and death to make decisions over their lives, and it's Joseph. No wonder they're terrified. No wonder they can't even answer him, respond to him. They are sure that now that they are in his hands, he will take his revenge on them, but he doesn't. He has, in fact, long since forgiven them. He doesn't even blame them. He says it was God who did it, even though they did it. It was not you who sent me here, even though they did, but God. And why? Well, to preserve their lives and the lives of many others from starvation and from a terrible famine that had gripped Egypt and Canaan and the whole Middle East. It was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So knowing that the famine was coming because God had spoken to Pharaoh through a dream, Joseph had interpreted it, he had been placed in charge, and so during the seven fat years, the abundant years, they stored and stored and stored the food for the seven lean years, the seven years of famine that would come. And that's why the brothers had come there, because they had heard that there was food. 
So what happens is that the family moves to Egypt. His father, they go back and get his father, the rest of the family. They all move to Egypt. They are reunited. But they still are not sure that they can really believe Joseph when he says that when he is gracious to them and merciful to them. You see, they are afraid that he is just waiting until their father dies and then he will take action against them, take his revenge. And that's where we pick it up then in Genesis chapter 50, starting at verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph, saying, Your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. And whether their father actually said that or not, I don't know. But it's what they say, their father said, hoping that that will tug at Joseph's heartstrings. And so then when their message came to him, though, Joseph wept, and he wept because they didn't understand. Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Joseph had meant it, and he says it again. He acknowledges their guilt. You intended to harm me. He says that. But he still ascribes it to God. He still says, but God intended it for good. Now, I don't know about you, but that whole thing blows me away. Not just the way that Joseph forgives. Not just his generosity and mercy, incredible as that is. Because humanly speaking, what do you want to do in a situation like that? It's incredible enough as it is. But the mindset that he displays to us here is something that really strikes me. And that is his incredible statement that God has been in control all along. In the face of everything that has happened, even when it appears that God is not in control even when it appears that evil is taking place, even when evil is indeed taking place in this instance, in the face of what his brothers did, Joseph is convinced that God is in control through all of this, that God was at work in all of this, in fact that God was doing something that he could not have done any other way. Think about it with me. Joseph is next to youngest son of this uh, large family. They're nomads, uh, sheep herders, and so on, out in the sticks in Canaan. Nobody's heard of them. Nobody knows them. We do. They're in the Bible, but that's because the Bible was written later and tells us about it, and we read it. At the time, they were nobody. How are you going to get this kid? Not just to Egypt, but into the palace of Pharaoh, the most powerful man of the age and get him to become his right hand man, the one to whom he entrusts all of the power in Egypt, all of his power to save their lives and the lives of everyone else in this terrible famine. So how does he do it? Well, he does it this way. And on the face of it, it doesn't make any sense. But by the end, you can see that that's exactly what he's done. He has moved this nobody kid from a nobody family, from a nowhere place, into this position of power using these circumstances. And ultimately, it's for a greater purpose than even Joseph recognizes or realizes. Because in preserving Joseph's family, his father Jacob, also known as Israel, his brothers who become the names of the 12 tribes of Israel, along with Joseph's two sons, they, God is preserving his people who he has chosen to become a nation to whom he will give a land that will be their own, the land that they had come out of where they were just herders. 
He is preserving the royal line of David long before David is born, perhaps a thousand years before David is born. And ultimately then, the royal son of David who comes out of that line, Jesus, the Messiah, come to save his people from their sin. The one who gives salvation to everyone who calls upon his name. The reason you and I are gathered in this place and can call on God as our Father. And so here we are now entering the Christmas season. Advent starts next week when we celebrate the coming of Jesus Christ and his birth. And this Sunday we are seeing in Joseph's story how God orchestrated events about three and a half or 4,000 years ago so that we could celebrate Christmas and Jesus today. So that we can belong to him, find salvation in him, follow him. God accomplishes his purposes, though he may use strange ways to do so. Joseph had no idea of that big picture. But he did know that God was in control despite everything. He knew that God works all things for the good of those who love him. As Paul says several thousand years later in the New Testament in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Did he always know that? I doubt it. He must have had some incredibly hard and dark times along his journey. Think about it. His father had loved him above all of the others. He was the most favored. He was the golden boy. That was part of the trouble between him and his brothers, in fact. He had dreams from God of a place and position of his brothers bowing down. And he really unwisely shared that with his brother, expecting them to rejoice with him when huh, they wouldn't, when they already hate him because he's the favorite and they resent it. And now they've got more to resent. And so what happens then all flows out of that and does it look like those dreams are coming true? Does it look like those things that God had said and purposed were to come to pass? No. His brothers set out to kill him are only dissuaded because of an argument by his older brother to leave him in the pit that they put him in. They end up selling him into slavery to some slave traders who come by and he goes off to a far and distant land, his life is over. It's done. That's it. Now, mind you, he starts to make something of himself in that new land. He gains favor because the Lord is with him, with Potiphar, who is a royal official, and he becomes in charge of all of Potiphar's estate. Potiphar trusts him with everything. And then what happens? Bang. He is unjustly accused by Potiphar's wife uh, of something because he refuses to sleep with her. He will not do it. And so she unjustly accuses him. He's thrown into prison. He's lucky to be in prison, not to be dead. And again, you think, his life is over. Now what? And yet in prison, he ends up coming into positions of responsibility again he's, and to trust there. He ends up interpreting the dream of a man who is cupbearer to the, uh, the king, the pharaoh. And he is able to tell him that God is saying to you in this dream that you are going to be restored to your position. And when you have been restored, remember me. And sure enough, he is restored to his position. And it looks hopeful. And can you imagine what happens after that? Because the guy does not remember him. And can you imagine how Joseph must have felt in that prison, waiting day after day after day? Perhaps today will be the day. And then as slowly hope dies, it's done. He'd had a chance to at least get out, and it's gone. You think he must have doubted by times in the dark places? Yeah, I think he did. I think he did. 
You can imagine what it felt like as that hope slowly died. Until one day, Pharaoh has a dream no one could interpret. And then the guy remembers Joseph, because he interprets dreams. And so then they call Joseph. He comes out of prison. He's in Pharaoh's presence. He interprets the dream no one else can. And Pharaoh, seeing who he is and that God is with him, entrusts to him then the task of gathering all the foodstuffs up for the future and of running the land, managing his estate, if you will, the whole country. Everything happens all at once. So did Joseph struggle with fears and doubts along the way and in the darkness? I'm sure that he did. And yet he can say, and it's often afterwards that you look back, that God was in control. So what can we learn from Joseph's story? I think there are three things that we can learn from it. The first is to trust ourselves to God. That's what Joseph did. The Lord was with Joseph is the refrain throughout the story. And in the end, he can even say, what you meant for harm, God meant for good. You didn't really send me here. God did. He is saying God was really in control all the way through, not himself, not other people, not circumstances, God. God really is in control. Always. Really. And he really is at work to accomplish his purposes. And nothing can prevent him from accomplishing his purposes. Nothing will frustrate his plans. He's at work even in the things that we don't understand, just as Joseph didn't understand, doing things that he cannot do any other way. It does not mean that we should just live passively, let life do to us what it will. You know, the case sera, sera, what will be, will be. No, there are places to stand and fight, places to push and so on, to do our part in it, but having done so, we're not responsible for the outcome. God is. Because God's the one who's in control. Now that's the fundamental mindset that Joseph displays here, and it's the one that he would recommend, I think, to us too then. Trust yourselves to God. No matter what it is, no matter what happens, no matter what the circumstances are like, no matter what somebody does to you or doesn't do to you, trust God. He's really in control, even when it seems like it's not. Second thing then is live wherever you are. In that process, live wherever you are. Whatever your circumstances may be, no matter how bad it gets, Joseph did that. And you can see that in the story as it unfolds. Because what happens is that the Lord is with him. People recognize who he is and his giftedness. They recognize his essential integrity and that they can trust him. And they start putting him in charge of things. So at Potiphar's house, he becomes in charge of the whole man's estate. In prison, he is trusted with everything that happens inside the prison among the convicts there. That would not happen if he had just curled up and died. That would not happen if he had just said, oh, I give up, forget it, I can't. No, it happens because he continues to live where he is, and as he lives, people see things in him that they then respond to. So wherever he was, it may not have been the fulfillment of his dream and all that, but he lived. It may have been hard, it may have been dark, it may not have been what he expected, but he lived. And I think that's what God says to us in those kinds of places in our lives too. It may be a place of struggle with finances or with illness or whatever the case may be. And something that we say, it's just in limbo. I can't really live until whatever happens, you know, that, that to get me out of this. Now live where you are. There's life to be found there. So trust ourselves to God. Live wherever you are. And then the third thing is to forgive, to let go of anger and bitterness. See, we tend to look to other people to blame someone. And it may be other people, as it was for Joseph. It may be God who we blame. It may be life. You know how that goes. I can't believe it. I mean, it's happening again. Life. Huh. You're blaming life, right? And so we look for things to blame and someone to blame for it. And Joseph certainly had someone to blame, his brothers. 
But he didn't, even though he could have. He kept his focus on God, not on his enemies or his circumstances, but on God. And so then he could forgive his brothers, he could let go of the anger and bitterness that was there, and had done so, it appears, long before his brothers showed up on the scene, or I don't think he could have responded the way that he did there that day in that room in front of them. He could do it because of his mindset, his perspective, that it was God who was really in control no matter what it looked like. And see, when we think that we're at the mercy of someone else or the circumstances or life or God himself, whatever, uh, and we don't trust him in that, we can, anger and bitterness can set into that. It can become a pit for us, a trap if we let it, a place where we twist and turn because we can't find a way out of it, we can't let go of it, but we don't have to let it be that. Especially if we have a perspective like Joseph's. That despite what it looks like sometimes, God really is in control. He has our best interests at heart. As Paul says in the New Testament, long before Joseph came on the scene, that God works all things for good for those who love him. Always. So trust ourselves to God. Live wherever you are. Let go of anger and bitterness. Focus instead on God. And let that perspective then that God is in control and I'm going to trust myself to him, let that be our perspective. Now I want to consider briefly what Joseph said to his brothers. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. And the sermon title is God Meant It for Good. Now is that true? I think it is. I'm not talking about people as Joseph was. I'm talking about Satan. You see, we do have an enemy. An enemy of our souls. And we talked about that two weeks ago at Remembrance Day service on November 11th, that we are in a world that is at war. And so we live in a battleground, and we have an enemy. And he seeks to cause us harm. And that's true for every one of us personally, everyone who is a believer. It is true for this church and every church because Satan does not like the followers of God. Martin Luther put it this way in his great hymn, For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal. And so he will seek to harm us in any way that he can. And it may be to strike at places in our hearts, things that we depend upon in our lives, our health, our finances, things like that, our jobs, what have you. And it may be places then that throw us into darkness and despair. But what he intends for harm, God intends for good. And as a matter of fact, God does things in that that he cannot do any other way. And we see that very, very clearly in one historic incident in particular. Satan's greatest victory turned out to be his greatest defeat. He crucified Jesus. He was dead now. And it turns out that that was what God intended in the first place so that he could be the sacrifice, so that he could be salvation, and that God raises him back up from the dead. And so what Satan had intended for evil, God meant for good. Isn't that incredible when you think about that? And think about that. If that's true there, what if that's true in your life and in mine? What if that's true then that God has plans and purposes for you and for me as his people? And that he really is in control and that where things cast us into despair and we think life is over, life is done, I cannot live in this place. And God is at work in it and intends good in it. I'm going to take a bit of a risk here because I'm going to tell you where this sermon came from for me personally because this has been something personal for me that I've wanted to share with you. And that is that This story started to speak to me around the time that Synod decided, made its decisions, and Pastor John's suspension started. Now, I want to make very clear to you something here. I am not saying that what struck me there 
was you intended it for evil. Like you, you, and you, and you. No. What struck me was the other half of it. God meant it for good. Joseph said, am I God? And he's really saying that to judge people. Am I God? No. All I know is we've gone through difficult time. It's been difficult in different ways for different of us. But what began to form in me there personally was a conviction that God was doing things that he could not do any other way. Way. And I've seen that play out over the last number of months. I've seen it play out in console. I've seen it play out in my life. You've seen it play out in Mike Matthewson preaching up here because he had to on a Sunday morning because I was gone and John was suspended. And you've seen him step into a place that he wouldn't have stepped into otherwise. God does things he couldn't have done any other way. And that began to shape my perspective on the events that had happened. It began to shape my perspective on life. And how life works and unfolds. Do I always believe that? No. It's just like Joseph. I'm sure there were times, like I said, when he struggled with that. And I do too, and so do you. In the places of darkness, it's hard to hold on to what you know in the light, isn't it? It's a lot harder there. But that's the paradox, you see. It's easy to say, but it's hard to live. But you learn it by living it. Joseph learned it by living it. Joseph learned it by going through what he went through. That's how he learned that God is really in control, that it was really about God, nothing else. That's why he learned that he could trust himself to God and that he could live where he was. And that's why he learned then that he could let go and let go of, uh, forgive. He could let go of anger, bitterness, whatever was there in his heart, whatever was a trap to him. Because he learned it there in the middle of things. It was in the middle of things that we are told a number of times through the story, the Lord was with Joseph. That's Christmas, you know. We're coming into Advent next week. We're coming into the Christmas season. It's starting to feel like it because all of a sudden it snowed. So it's like a change of seasons and we start to think that way. That's Christmas. That's God with us, Emmanuel. That's Jesus. God among us. And that's always been his promise is that he would be with us in everything. And that he's at work in everything. And we see that so, so clearly in his son Jesus and what happened to him. And Satan's greatest victory, which was really Satan's greatest defeat. Because it's there, you see, in those kinds of places in that kind of darkness that the disciples learned it too. All is well. He is God in control. I know not all his plans, but I know I'm in his hands. And when you're in his hands, know this about God. He never lets go. He never lets go of those he loves, of his people. He never lets go even when it feels like it. Because we're held firm in the grip of the rock of all the ages.